one. This is my best kind of shonen. Because we didn't touch one of them. One of them. Not even one of them. I'm not sure which one is Paul Rudd and which one is Lane Green. Final card here is the, the ultimate outcome. Today is take your dog to work day. Oh, like Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Without further ado, his debut. Sweet Caroline. <laughs> Everybody say hello to Sammy. Is I'm that not good? I'm just pausing so that you just are at the front of your seat. I'm so enormously flattered. Branding is not a bad blind date. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to take a picture of this. No, this is agape. This is love. I really enjoyed this. You did do your homework. You asked great questions. I'm flattered. Thank you. You just, you just made my day. Look at you. You are I mean, insane. How did I do that? You're how insane. did I do that? You're insane. <laughs> well, good evening to you uh, on this uh, beautiful weekend day. Uh, I am Joseph Jaffe, and I am your host on Corona TV. Obviously, uh, it is not evening. It is not the weekend, but it is National Opposite Day, and I'm not really sure what else we're meant to do about National Opposite Day, uh, except to, I guess, maybe the message is, to swim against the current. Maybe this is a message about conformity. Maybe it is about originality. Maybe it is about uh, the ability for us to find our place in the world. Or maybe it is about weight and weight loss because it is fat blogging day today. And uh, yeah, fortunately I went up a pound last week. I'm now down a pound. So this is one opposite direction that I always want to be heading, which is down, down, down on the ground, ground, ground. Uh, Tom Morris is here. He says, sitting perfectly still to hide all body language while listening and watching. I will be looking for your tells, my friend. He said, it's also George Costanza Day. Uh, and so if it is George Costanza Day, I guess what that means is if I feel like I peak at any point early in today's uh, episode of Corona TV, I just go, I'm out! you know, and basically walk off set uh, and leave on a high. Well, uh, we'll see if that happens or not. But today I am uh, I am in the hot seat because my guest is Scott Rouse. He's a body language expert. He's an analyst. Uh, I think he's a hero um, for the work that he actually performs. Um, but I'm also uh, acutely nervous because, he, you know, he's going to be reading me like a book. He's going to be looking for the tells. He's going to be looking every time I touch my face or my nose. Um, I was even nervous about my glasses. So, so you know, you've got A uh, and, you, and you've got B. W which set of glasses makes me more believable, makes me look more truthful, more authentic? I'm not sure. One uh, or two. These are the ones I've been wearing for a while. These are my old ones. We'll see if Scott has a take on whether this look is a believable look uh, or not. Uh, now, Scott, of course, is our guest today. Tomorrow, Ford Sachs, um, who uh, rescheduled. He has recovered, thank goodness, from, from COVID. Uh, Lauren Griffiths on Wednesday. I've told you a lot about her and her incredible story on LinkedIn. Pulitzer Prize winner Daniel Golden on Thursday. And then finally, another wonderful community uh, uh, episode. Um, am I going backwards? Yeah, I think I was going backwards. Uh, Judy Glover, uh, um, Mark Borowitz. Uh, Jason Borowitz, Peter Shankman, uh, Chad Dick, and David Berkowitz. The other David Berkowitz. I will say Scott Rouse has not interrogated. Uh, I don't think he's interrogated either David Berkowitz's, but this guy seems to be a, a good guy. Um, let's do birthdays quickly. Uh, happy birthday to Angelina Jaspers. Uh, she was on the show on Friday, previous guest on the show. Uh, Diane Hessen, another guest on the show. If you've been a guest on the show, you always get called out. Maxine Lurie, uh, who uh, responded earlier to me. Uh, and then, of course, on LinkedIn, uh, Chelsea, uh, happy birthday, Rudy. And finally, Wasim Imdad. I uh, hope you guys are all having an awesome day. Let's get into the soliloquy, shall we? And, of course, today's soliloquy is appropriately named, given the topics that we're going to be talking about, Liar, Liar. I have to tell you, I have always been fascinated by the world in which my guest today calls home. Some call it body language or reading nonverbal cues, but I like the idea of spotting tells, nervous tics, 
habitual movements, eye rolls or, or touching that gives a person away. Vegas is ground zero for me and a high stakes game of no limit Texas Hold'em or perhaps Hollywood's depiction of a moment of pressure where one bead of sweat gives up a character and spots a crack in the armor of bravado. Of course, there are plenty of other use cases like spotting when a politician is not telling the truth, although you don't need uh, to be an expert for this. As the old joke goes, how do you know when a politician is lying? Their lips are moving. Come to think of it, maybe we need experts like Scott to identify when they are telling the truth. That's opposite day for you. Then there's real life with respect to law and order, true crime, or even military interrogations. I'm equally fascinated by this world. Lie detectors exist, but they're still, they're still not admissible in court to the best of my knowledge. What about human lie detectors? What role do they play? To date, there's been no machine that delivers the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But I wonder if artificial intelligence will find a way to change that. There's also no truth serum, except on uh, screenwriters, typewriters. Well, there is tequila, but that's another story for another day. Whichever way you look at it, it is both art and science to read people in love, in life, in business. Sometimes it's easier than other times, bad liars or bad liars. But what about good liars? Is it fact or fiction that you can train yourself to pass a lie detector test? How do you spot or expose a good liar? Is it true that once a liar, always a liar? Once a cheater, always a cheater? Or what about someone who says, trust me, or I would never lie to you, or can I be honest with you? I have many questions. Thankfully, my guest today has many answers. The only problem is that I have no way of knowing if he's telling the truth or not. I guess that's just half the fun of today's show, and I just hope I'm in the good half. Well, now it's time to bring him onto the show. Uh, he gave me a very uh, short, and you can always see the humble guests. They're the ones that come with the very short intros. Scott, this is what he said. He said, Scott Rouse is a body language expert and analyst. He trains law enforcement and the military in interrogation and body language. But when somebody does that, I typically say, you know what? I'm going to one-up you and find something just a little bit more meatier uh, to be able to uh, play. So, um, you know, I was thinking of uh, playing something like this. I'm going to give you some information that's going to change every interaction you have with every person you come in contact with from this day forward for the rest of your life. If you share this information with your friends and your family and the people you love the most, maybe today we in this room can change the world just a little bit for the better. Are you ready? Here we go. I met Scott Rouse many, many years ago. Scott has been uh, one of my close friends for a long time. He's had an interesting life, one of the top interrogators in the world, one of the top body language experts in the world. So let's give him a hand and welcome our good friend, Scott Rouse. Body language expert Scott Rouse analyzing the answer sees much more than what Tuya Sissoko is saying. Became suspicious. Turns out Dr. Phil was suspicious too. Body language expert Scott Rouse sees things much differently. Rouse says the player's smiles are fake. The reason I stand out in the body language community of speakers, trainers, and teachers is because I bring people out of that caveman era of body language. With updated scientific facts and research, I walk them right into the middle of the modern day. And that's the reason best-selling authors of body language books have me go over their books first. They want to make sure everything is correct before they publish. I train law enforcement and the military in interrogation and body language. I also work with mediators and Fortune 100 CEOs and teach them body language skills as well. So who's the most famous liar of all time? This man. Because we knew, as Village knew, when he lied, his nose grew. But they didn't know it until somebody else in the village told them what was going on. Hey man, uh, you see that wooden kid? Kid made out of wood with the red pants and little hipster hat? When he lies, nose grows. Hand to God. What? 
you told me? That little cricket? We did it. We actually did it. I didn't, I didn't think I was going to get here. I mean, how many times we try, do we try to do this? Like nine? This is take four, and that is a record for me since I started the show. Um, but I, you know, something in me was like, I need to meet him. I need to connect with him. I need to do the show, and, uh, and it was worth it. Um, the first time, I believe... Uh, it, and and I'm, I think I remember it. The first time was the storm when, when we had no power and no cell right. phone reception. And right. I just canceled all my shows that week. The second time, um, and actually, I mean, to your credit, what I'd realized is, um, is that from a guest relation standpoint, there were too many weeks where I just had all men and, and I needed to mix it up. And you very immediately just said, I'm fine to reschedule. Uh, had I known how difficult it would have been, I would have, <laughs> I would have kicked someone else to the curb. Um, I didn't know it was going to be that bad either. The third time, you live in Nashville, and uh, mm. un unfortunately, there was a pretty big event that happened in Nashville recently, and and all hell broke loose. Um, mm. But this is the fourth time, and uh, we're, and we're going to make it count. So, welcome to the show, Scott. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. And sorry it took me so long to get here. No, I mean, yeah, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be worth it. Now, in terms of getting to know the real Scott Rouse, I'm trying to like read you and learn about you. I'm not sure that I'm going to do a good job, but I did notice in that little video, you're very softly spoken yeah, and, and the way that you invite your audience in. And I think that is endearing, obviously. And I think that's probably something that that brings people's guards down, you know, in terms of welcoming someone in um so yeah. is, is that a good read or uh or do i not know what the hell i'm talking about no that that's exactly what it is that's exactly what it is and it's the same way in interrogation and that's so it's sort of a uh a, a side thing from that i guess it comes in from that because if you're being interrogated and you want to get out all you got to say is four words i want my lawyer then you gotta then you can leave i gotta leave so to to get that person to want to stay and be with you that's that's the key. They gotta like you. They gotta be. They gotta want to be there with you, even though you're asking about some horrible stuff. You want them to stay there. And and the reality must be that you know the game coming into it, and yet you're still gonna lose at the game when someone knows how to play it better than you do. Yeah, I haven't met them yet, but I'm sure there's a I'm sure there's a good one out there. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that that's what they think. Obviously, the more I guess the more confident they come into that that one-on-one -on -one, the easier it's like taking candy from a baby well yeah because you use that you use that to your advantage the smarter somebody thinks they are and the and the the less educated and less less smart you make yourself seem less intelligent the better off you're going to be because you can you can re-ask questions without you know and make them feel even even bigger even smarter and then you use that ego against them as you move forward so the, the, there were a bunch of things that in my soliloquy, and and I want to get to that. Normally, we'd spend a bit of time as an icebreaker doing, you know, what I call fun facts, uh, and this is where I get to kind of disarm my guests. So, for example, we learn things about you, like you were a, a record producer. This is one of the uh, vault photos that we were able to uh, buy on the, uh, you know, uh, the secondary market, or. Uh, I love this one about you, which which apparently yeah, uh, that's you old collect, though. Yeah, can you believe that? You know, you yeah. collect old comedians' autographs. You've got to tell us a quick, quick story of maybe your most uh, famous or prized uh, autograph. Did I tell you about that? No, you didn't. Huh? Where'd you hear that? I mean, you mean about the fun fact? Yeah. yeah. Oh, listen, listen. You're not the only private investigator, my friend. I'll have to tell you about that offline. No, I, I, do you want the real answer? Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I actually surprised you. In the yeah. original interview, there was a, a good, I, I don't know if I should even tell you, tip my hand, but I'm going to because I'm trying to show you that I'm believable and authentic. You actually, okay. but I will tell you in all truth, 
you um, uh, completed a form, uh, which was the things you oh. wanted to talk about. Oh. See, I should have kept yeah. you guessing, but you see, I'm, yeah. an, I'm, an, I'm an honest guy, right? So whenever anyone yeah. says I'm an honest guy, that probably tells you they're dishonest. I actually have that. I actually have that same picture with, with their autographs on them. So, because I collect old comedians' autographs, that, that's that's wow. so weird. But that's that's what that's that's what I collect. So I've got everybody. If you well, that's funny, and, and that was just I've that was it. just a, that was that was just fluke or circumstance that I went to look at. Uh, I typed in comedians' autographs. Isn't that funny? That that yeah that's crazy. yeah. Except they said that see where it says two thousand five heritagecoin dot com. Mine doesn't say that on it. It's an actual picture from. It's actually one of their old pictures. Their that's old, I mean. Old that's amazing. Uh, that's amazing. Well, okay. So you ended up surprising me. So yeah. in in my soliloquy, I spoke about uh, a couple of things. One is um, I spoke about my glasses. Um, is there is there any is there anything to that to to a pair of glasses or or is that just you know? Well, in that one, you look that that makes you. I would trust you much faster than I would with the, with the round ones on. Yeah, because it looks like you're, yeah, because those are, are, those are more common. Maybe it's because they're like mine. I don't know, or they're similar to mine. But I, I think that would be more um, where you're trying to blend in instead of stick out is what I would think. I was going to look at that and have some thoughts on it. I'll tell you what I did learn through this process is that these glasses need to be cleaned, uh, but I can do that afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. th there was something else in the soliloquy that I just wanted to um, – press you, well, not press you on, but just uh, ask you, uh, AI, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we, we are told as, as consumers, as citizens, you know, we, we, we all buy into this magic and aura mystique of the polygraph, the lie detector test. But with artificial intelligence and heat mapping and being able to look at body temperature, is it conceivable that this will come down to a fine art with zero defect at some point where a machine will essentially be able to tell if someone's being truthful or not or is that maybe just sci-fi yeah that's pretty much sci-fi because even a lot even, most people are under the impression that a, that a lie detector test can tell if you're telling the truth or not it can't and most of the time the person doing it it's it's a little show to get you to tell to tell more the key to a lie detector test is the person giving it because they're the, they're the ones that are that that uh, the and if I was to ever have to have one done, if I'd been accused of something, so would you take a lie detector test? I'd say you bet I will, but get me the oldest person you can find that's done those. That's the person I want, the old, the, the one who's been around the longest. Give me that person because they're good at reading people, and most of it is watching those reactions. You see a lot of things happen. You see the galvanic response. You see, you see all kinds of things. You sweat. Your your blood pressure may go up, but that doesn't mean you're not telling the truth. If you ask me, if you said, um, let's pretend I am being asked about killing somebody, let's say, and it, let's say it's you. And they say, well, well let me ask you about Joseph Jaffe. And I said, okay. And I said, did, did you kill him? And I'd be, no, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. No, you know, but I may have, let's say you and I go hang out. We become like great friends over for two years before this, but it would, when your name came up and then I know you're dead, I realize, you know, I, I having in, in my grief over this, my blood pressure may go up. There may be a lot of changes from that simply because of your name coming up. So it would be th those things aren't aren't reliable. That's why you can't use them in court. I mean, everybody thinks it's the last word on um, body language, but it's or understanding body language. But it's de it's definitely not. It's definitely not. I do love that insight that even you know even with the machine, right? In this case, a polygraph. It's the human being administer, administering the test or, quite frankly, even interpreting the results. And I suppose when you factor in things like selective bias uh, and coming in with our own preconceived notions of, I suppose it would be the same thing with respect to the concept of a jury and being able to weed out and determine if someone is an eligible juror or not. I, I have to tell you, I think that I, I, I don't think I would ever sit on a jury because I just assume everyone is innocent. I can never ever believe that anyone could be guilty. Um, and so I would, I, I suppose I would be easy meat for one side and immediately rejected uh, for the other, but that's just me. Yeah. 
Well, if you want to get off, the, if you if you ever get jury duty and you don't want to be on it, say tell them they when they ask you about yourself or on your thing, say I'm a body language expert, and they're gonna go well truth or whether they're honest or dishonest, they'll get rid of you. Oh, I'm, you know, now, this, this is why you watch Corona TV, because now you just helped a whole bunch of people uh, get out of uh, jury duty. You know, I'll just say ever since Scott Rouse came on my show, I've been so fascinated on body language and tells that I've just been, I've become an absolute student. Um, okay, I won't, I won't mention your name, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, Scott, your your website is it's a rabbit hole that that I could probably spend the rest of my life on. So interesting, your thought leadership, your articles, and and also I think how you've created this beautiful bridge between almost like a day job and a night job or this skill, this craft of yours, and then the ability to apply it in life, in love, uh, in business. But one of the things that I that I immediately saw was going back to the Nashville uh, bomber. Um, you you wrote an article, and 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 it was fascinating to me because you basically were just analyzing his driver's license. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I was I, I remember back to this idea, you know, the old adage, which is if you look like your passport photo, you're probably too sick to travel. Uh, there was that old joke. Um, but but tell us a little bit about that post, and 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 quite frankly, what you can in fact learn from someone's driver's license uh, photo, even though when we go to the DMV, we often don't even, you know, we're kind of shuffling and didn't even realize our photo was going to be taken and and we look awkward anyway in it. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in, in that case, most everyone gives at least a little bit of a smile, you know, because it's uncomfortable and you, you feel weird. People are standing in line watching you and they're saying, okay, look at the camera. And you ought, just from always being in front of a camera from since you were a child, you'll go, you have a little goofy little smile on your face. And in this situation, we're seeing a whole lot going on there. One of the things, it, it's the blank stare that you see. But if you'll look at, if you'll take a look at his face, a lot of times you'll see people who are going through um, deep psych psychological um, situations. If you'll half his face, if you'll just put a line right down one and just show one half, and then show the other half, you'll see a dramatic difference in the uh, expression there, simply just from the the eyebrow over there on, on to the right, but it's on his left. You know, he's he's just he's he's just there, and I think he's he, from what that looks like to me is he's just been there for a long time, you know, ready to go. He's what he's that's that's just my not my impression of it. You really can't tell a whole lot from just looking at someone's picture, like tons and tons of stuff. But there are some things that will stand out sometimes, and that blank stare I've seen it several times and i'm sure that's the that's the same face he would use at the grocery store at the bank anywhere he went and that's one of the um the hallmarks that, that you'll see when someone is in a, in a depressive state of that magnitude so i guess the point is there always there always are clues or crumbs or easter eggs you just have to be able to be open to them uh, aware of them and be able to spot them um, you know, as opposed to, and, 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 and oftentimes, you know, you always hear the phrase, uh, they were my neighbor. I never suspected anything. You know, there's always this idea of, of the guy or the girl next door, um, mm -hmm. being innocuous. But I think your point is in reality, it's anything but. Yeah. A lot, a lot of times that's right. You know, but sometimes if it's your neighbor, you're just used to seeing them. You see them quite often and they're doing the same thing every time. You know, they, they look the same. Nothing really much changes. If there is a dramatic change, usually you'll notice it'll, it'll leave on you know, the next day or so. Or they may be going through a situation where someone in their family is sick. They've got a new They've lost their job or something like that. Um, but when you see a look like that guy had, it's it, that's a that's that's a it's a real bummer to see it. You know, when you when you see something like that, it doesn't look like much. You know, it really doesn't look like much at all. But when you when you look at it for a minute, you go, ooh. That, that that says a lot. Now I couldn't have spotted that and said this guy's going to blow up downtown Nashville. Nobody could have. Yeah, you, you, that can't be done. But afterwards, you can and go. Well, that makes sense. That looks like it is to me. That's why body language is one of those things where you look at it and go, um, "How can well? How do you know if this person is is this type of person, that style of person?" And he's, you don't know just by looking at him. You can't tell. You can tell somebody's might be happy with the way they smile. You can tell if they might be 
sad or depressed by the way they look, but you, you don't get, uh, you know, a full on breakdown of their, their personality and what kind of person they are. Some people are looking at a picture. It's impossible. I think the one thing that I also take away from that is that you, you, as you said, you can generally not predict or project forward, but you can look backwards and make sense of, of things, why they happen. We, I think we as, as, as a, as society, the worst thing for us is, is the unknown is not to, is, is not to know why. Why did they do it? The, you know, sometimes the motives aren't always uh, there. And again, again, we're not talking, we're talking about a Nashville bomber, but we could also be talking about, um, uh, you know, a spouse who who walks out on their family or or has some kind of a, a, a midlife crisis. So we always want to make sense of it. And I think that gives us comfort in terms of being able to at least answer the questions, right? Right, right. Yeah, I agree with that. So, so he, the most famous liar of all time. Uh, he's not a politician. It, it, it's this guy. Uh, yes. Love that that anecdote, and uh, uh, especially the part of the the talking cricket. Um, but you actually wrote um, one of your fantastic articles. You wrote were was three things about liars you may not know. There is a ton of this these gems uh, on your site, videos and and uh, and photos. And in this particular one, you spoke about three uh, aspects. Uh, one is the quick shoulder shrug. Two is not breaking eye contact. And three is moving back and or away. Um, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, uh, about you know, those three things and, and maybe give some pointers uh, to, sure. to people and to me and, and tell me how I'm acting today. How am I stacking up right now with you? Oh, fine. Believe me. Because I watched a couple of these. I'd know if you're if you were, you know, a deviant. I think, and if you, if there were any kind of weird thing going to happen, I think I'd be able to spot it. You'd be able to to get a good impression of whether that was going to happen or not. So, um, <clears throat> I won't do like a whole profile breakdown of you, but that's that's the. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Okay, guy. So. So tell yeah. us about these these three simple moves, right? The shoulder shrug. Uh, not breaking eye contact and then moving back and or away. Okay. Most people, we'll start with the, with the famous one, breaking eye contact. Most people are in the impression when you break eye contact, you're not, you're, that means you're lying. You're not being honest with them. There's something up there. However, that's not true. Not even a little bit. Because if, if you and I were talking, even when I look at you on, on, on this thing and, and, and we're talking, if I don't like look away just for a second, it's kind of weird. It's a little safer because we're on, you know, you're in South Africa, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. So it's a little different. But when, when someone breaks eye contact with you, they're thinking, you know, they're thinking, if you ask me, if I was to ask you, or you ask me say, what is 5,008 plus four minus 360 divided by two? If I just went, let's see, five thousand. I was looking at you the whole time. It'd be weird. But if I'm, but if I look away and go, gee, uh, I've, I don't know, you know, unless, but if I was looking at you the whole time, what, I don't know, your brain wants to keep looking at the person. One reason you, that, that the liar most of the time doesn't look away or break eye contact is because they want to keep looking at you and make sure you understand or that you believe what they're saying. So if they, if they get the impression, if you start going like that a little bit, then they're going to add qualifiers to their answer make it sound more believable. They'll start, they'll, they'll start uh, protecting it, make it, make it a little stronger, you know, build it up a little bit more, putting little things on it. And those are just words and phrases and statements that'll make it, that'll make it stronger. Right. So, so if you're, just to add, so, so essentially why they're not breaking eye contact with you is because if they're really good at what they do, they're looking for every visual cue in order for them to pivot or ramp up or course correct. Right, right. So they, they want to make sure you believe their lie as they're lying to you. That's why they don't look away most of the time. But everybody thinks liars break eye contact. And it's it's like just just the opposite of that. One of the other things you'll, you'll hear about is when someone is lying, they'll back away. A lot of times you'll see that. as they, they'll, they'll back up or just sit back a little bit. And a lot of times it's not like that much. It'd be very subtle. It could be if I was if I was saying... This reminds me of the time we found three dinosaurs back in the in the early 80s. And see, I moved back just a little bit as I was saying that. 
it's not that I'm going, I better back up and get away, but I'm not comfortable saying that. So I naturally want to get away from you a little bit because what I'm saying isn't true. And your brain goes, man, this is not good. This isn't good. Yeah, I know. It's what you're saying to yourself. You're not saying to yourself consciously, but that's what's going on in there. As you tell that lie, so you may step back a little bit. One thing I found when I was working with entrepreneurs, I was the entrepreneur in residence at the Nashville Entrepreneur Center from 2011 to 2017. And what I did there was train um, entrepreneurs and startups how to create what I called an investable pitch. And, and the thing I had, the thing I ran everybody through was called how to create an investable pitch. And one of the things that I would teach them not to do was when they were given their the CEO who's pitching, it should be every time when they're given the information about their finances. A lot of times that person, they've got a great idea about the finances and they should, but they don't know the intricacies of it. But when they're being asked a question about the, the minutia of their finances, if they don't say, Hey, let me let my finance guy tell you about that. If they're going to answer the question because they've been given the data and they say, well, what is your, what about this for your company? What about this money wise, money, money percentage. And they start giving the answer. A lot of times they'll go, well, here's what I think. And they'll back up a little bit. Every time I've seen that, that person doesn't know the details, but they've gotten them from their financial person, which is fine. But in your brain, looking at them, that's just one thing that tells you from, from your brain, looking at them, ah, it's something's, that's just a little, just a tiny little teeny weeny red flag that you may see as an investor. So you wonder what's wrong with that. You may not notice it then, but later on when you, when your gut feeling comes together about the pitch you've seen in that person, that may come up in there. So you want to make sure when you start telling, start giving them information about your finances, you may take a, a half step forward because a lot of times when people are, 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 when they talk about finance for some reason and they're the financial person, you'll see them come in a little bit because they're confident with their answer. So you want to do little things that show you're confident with your answer. The shoulder shrug, a lot of times when, when if, if you ask me a question and I said, I, I don't know, that's pretty quick. It lasts about a second, second and a half. But if they go, if it's a really quick thing or just one, quite often, not every time. There are no absolutes in body language. So just because I do that doesn't mean I'm lying mm. but, or, or being deceptive. But that's one thing you look for is that real quick thing like that. I, th I don't know. I don't know. That's what, because that person may really not know. And that's just their, they don't move a whole lot. But if they're, ba if you baseline this person and saw their movements are fairly fluid and they're, and they're, when they're talking, they'll, do specific things or illustrators. These are illustrators. When I say I didn't do it, that's my brain emphasizing I didn't and do it. So you want to see those happen, but they've got to happen on the words. If I said I didn't do that, then that's weird. I would say I didn't do that. So uh, then again, showing confidence, I come forward and I'm hitting those right on, on the money. But you want in the, in the shoulder shrug, if it's happening too quick, then they're just adding that because they think it, it should look good because it's last about a second, second and a half for a real one instead of just a real quick. Uh, it, like it, it's almost like a scene from The Princess Bride, right? I know that you know that I know that you know that I know. Um, exactly. But clearly this should come with a warning label. It's like do not operate uh, heavy machinery without a license. Um, yeah. and, and I suppose while we're talking about it, the obvious one, which is, the touching of the face indicates uh, some kind of. Uh, uh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes. It's, it's, because there is no absolute is what you're telling us. Not one. There's not one single thing that I don't care what anybody's told you. I don't care what you've heard or who said it. They're not correct when they say, you can t I have a big nose so I can talk about noses. So when they say they scratch their nose, that means they're lying. No, it doesn't either. No, it doesn't either. It can mean they're, they're, nose itches. And some people say there's erectile tissue in your nose. No, that's somewhere else. I've got a big nose. It looks like I probably do, but I don't. <laughs> that, you know. That's a keeper. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, that's, so there are no absolutes. There's not one body language cue that'll tell you somebody's lying for sure. Except of course, if you're that wooden puppet, that wouldn't, wouldn't it's true. Puppet, in, which, that's in right. which case, in which case you're in big trouble. Um, That's his baseline. Yeah, his nose grows when he lies. So a hell of a baseline. We we got some very interesting uh, comments coming in, but but before I get to those comments, it was funny as you were talking about pitching. Um, uh, I this was something else that I'd pulled from you as well, exactly to the point, which is: Do you make these mistakes uh, when pitching? Um, so I, you know, as I was saying earlier, I love how you've created this beautiful bridge from your art, your craft, your skill into our working world. 
Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of these uh, these key pitching mistakes and what we can learn from them. Okay. Well, just, just to give you a little heads up, everybody I've ever worked with, every person to the person, man, woman, child, whoever it was, that I've trained to pitch, they've all been funded, every one of them. And I'm over this... By April, apparently, I'll I'll be over the half a billion mark in the money wow. I've, I've helped raise for. But it's there, but they're not people. Some of them get three hundred thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, but some of them get millions. So it's one of those. And I've been doing this quite a while. So it started in about two thousand eleven is when I started training entrepreneurs. But um, one of the things that that you want to do as you as you as you're pitching is to make sure you use a lot of open-handed gestures. Not so much that you're doing this all the time, but you want to make sure you use a lot of open-handed gestures. Mark Bowden, who who's who connected us, he's right. that guy. He's the guy can think that he's the the ultimate uh, keynote guy, the ultimate speaker, because he's got all those things down and he knows how to explain them correctly. So he's he's much better at talking about that than I am. But that's one of the things you want to do for for but in the pitching world, it's different, but it, it's a lot of stuff the same. But when you're when you're speaking, you want to give open handed gestures. You want to give a lot of open handed gestures, and you want to make sure that you don't that you're you're you, you have a pleasant look on your face when you first come in the room. A lot of people think, well, when I first when I get there, I'll start smiling. Yeah, get a little pleasant look on your face before everything starts when you first come in, because when people see you, they make up their mind about you. Their brain captures this information. There's well, I won't get into the intricacies of the neurological side of that. It'll take too long. But your brain, and there are some studies, like there's a study from Harvard about this. It's called the Thin Slices Study, if anybody's interested in it. But anyway, your brain, you see that person, whoever the, the person is you're seeing for the first time, and you decide whether you like them or not because your your brain says, that person looks familiar or they don't look familiar. Let's say you look familiar. That looks like my brother. I love my brother. He's funny. We have, <laughs> we've been together a long time i'm probably gonna like that person you don't say that consciously but your your brain tells you that subconsciously that person ooh. or your brain may see that person and go you know that looks like, like the guy used to hit on my wife when we were in, before we got married in college i don't think i like that guy he reminds me of that so you want to have that that pleasant smile on your face to help counteract all those things you may not be able to get around if you look just like the guy who's hitting on your wife but like the guy's wife but you you want to you make sure as you go in, you have a pleasant look on your face and the person you're looking for and the person you focus on when you're, when you're pitching, most people are on the impression you want to, when you're pitching something, let's say if it's to a room of 12 people or, or 500 or, or a thousand, we used to do things where we'd have a thousand um, investors come in from around the world. And we'd pitch to, we'd have our, our startups pitch to them. And one of the, th the key things that I would, would, would tell them, especially in the first few rows, because you really can't see very far back once because a lot of lights and stuff. But if you're in a, even in a small situation, the person you're looking for isn't the person doing this when you're pitching. You don't want that guy or that girl or that woman or that, that man. You want the person who's doing this. You know what I'm going. You don't want to touch in their face and their mouth and doing this and crossing their arms. And you want to turn sideways and cross those legs and put things. You want everything you think that should happen for an for an investor to be into what you're pitching. You want to see the opposite of that because what's happening there is they've gone up in their head and, and they're having what's called internal dialogue. And they're thinking, are these numbers going to work for me? Is this really going to work in three to five years? Is that graph right? I've got to go home and tell my wife that I'm putting $300,000 in this. When I get there, what is she going to think about it? And, or I've got to go back to the office and tell them this is what I'm, I'm putting our, one point two million dollars, and is this thing to, to to get us some of this because that that looks like it may work. When it, so that's how it works in sales as well. You want to see that face go like this because they're thinking to themselves. You want that look of is this guy full of it or is this girl full of it? That's what you want because you want them thinking critically about what you're talking about. And once you see that, those are the people you focus on. Not trying to get them to smile at all, but that's when, and you don't mm -hmm. smile, but you're at them trying to get them to smile. You want to give them more information and, and help assure them that what you're talking about is is good and true and, and you're being honest and this thing will, that you're talking about will work. So that's when you add the other body language things that, that will help you get break through that barrier of, is this person full of it or not? You want to get rid of that right away. And there are ways to do that. 
but you've got to be able to, but you've got to be honest. You can't be full of it and fool them for that because their brain's still going to pick up a little bit on that. Go up. Right. I mean, and, and what's really interesting about those insights is that it's kind of like the opposite when giving a presentation um, because, and we've had several uh, beautiful conversations on the show and the after show about where public speakers, you do a lot of public speaking, so do I, where we will typically fixate on the person who's not enjoying us when giving a presentation, when in actual fact, we should be doing the opposite, which is focusing on the people that are really into us and enjoying us and yeah. and, and, and fueling us and our energy. Um, and so that that's a, that's a beautiful, uh, and also it plays into the fact that it is National Opposite Day. So uh, there you go. That, that worked out. Now, I spoke earlier about this beautiful bridge and the delay in you coming on the show was perfect because you just put out a book. Um, and mm. uh, and so, uh, I mean, isn't it just perfect, right? Now you actually can come in and talk about this book and certainly we need a book like this. It's called Understanding Body Language, How to Decode Nonverbal Communication in Life love and work and you published it on my anniversary january 5th uh, 2021 um mm. so scott talk a little bit about this idea you know of specifically non-verbal communication and maybe just give a, an example of life love uh and work and i showed a little clip uh you know a little a couple of pages from the book where wow there are so many things going on uh in in any kind of interaction it's a little bit intimidating yeah. Well, the, the key is, under, is is beginning at the very basics of body language and understanding what makes people react. And it's their brain. That's where you start. Everything that happens begins with and is executed by the brain. Every reaction you have, everything you see, everything. So you start from there, but not getting into the neurological side of it. So it's boring. You just have to start simply. And so in this book, you can turn to any page and learn something. So it, I, I sort of walk you through the beginning of understanding why people act the way they do and what happens in the brain when they see something. And then that's very short. And then going on from there to the different situations you'll find yourself in like parties at work, at home, different situations and the different situations that will, that will come up there. You know, somebody, um, you think somebody didn't like you or you're, you're the shy person at a party. How do you notice that person? How do you notice when a person is not, they're trying to be the really cool person at the party, but they're, they may be a little nerdy and just kind of going out there trying to be nerdy or trying to be that the outgoing person for one of the first times. How do you know that? So you don't hurt their feelings or you can, you can maybe help them some if you want to be cooler, or be nicer to them. So it, it, it covers, it covers them and dating. How do you know if it's going well? You know, most everybody knows, but there's some little things like, you know, you hear some people say, well, I came home from that. And it was, it was, I thought it was great, but I never heard back from her. I never heard back from her. Or she won't return my calls or he won't return my calls. So I sort of point out those things to let you know ahead of time, even though it may look like it's going great, that sometimes it might be going sideways on you or just the opposite, being opposite day. It could be, you may think it's going horrible. But then you, I, there's a little story in there I, I tell about that where this this uh, girl thought it, it got, or a guy thought it gone really well, and the girl thought it went horrible, but she really liked him. But he thought she didn't, he didn't like her, and it's they're friends of mine, and now they're married and have kids and everything. The kids are grown up, but and that happened a long time ago. But it, I just I show you all a lot of those little things to look for to let you know if it's going well or not going well. In that I, situation. I, I have two questions relating to these uh, experiences. The first one is. It happens a lot in our lives where we go, I, I can't believe how wrong I read that. Or, you know, in a pitch, you know, in a presentation, in a job interview, you come out and you go, I crushed that. I literally, that was a home run. And it's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. how, how does that happen? Why does that happen? And how do we, how can we get it so wrong when, and, and, and I guess the, the follow up question to that is, is, are there ways to determine when in fact it is going sideways to then be able to in the moment immediately pull it back and change course? Yeah. Cause I, I talk about that in there, in there as well. A lot of times when you're, let's say you're, you're, you're in an interview and it seems like it's going really great. Well, you can know it's really great because it should, it should almost take up the entire time you're there. That's one thing. That's not body language, but that's, 
a little cube because they want to find out as much about you as they possibly can. They've seen your resume. They've been taught. They've been, you know, looking you up. I'm sure they've tried to find out about you on Facebook and Twitter and everything else. But as you go through, if you see a couple of things where they're, where they remain too open, they they want to get you out of there. If they're too nice, then they're just, then you're there. You might be wasting your time. You might find out early on if they're being a little bit too nice to you as you go through. And maybe all situations where, and you'll know it, if your skill set for that job may be a little bigger than they need, they may be being extra nice to you. But if it's one of those things where there's a lot of people in line, a lot of people are, are there for the same gig, there are things that can tell you that, that that may be going a little bit too quick or they're trying to get trying to get rid of you. Again, it's, it's like opposite day, right? It, it, it's It's almost like, uh, as this, as the saying goes, if things seem too good to be true, they generally are. So you're almost looking for the challenge. You're looking to be able to go, wow, that was tough. That was a tough yeah. interview. That was a challenge. Uh, Scott, one more question, and then I know that we've got some great questions from people that are watching okay. live right now. What about a virtual environment? So much of life, love, and 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 business now is spent in these, you know, boxes. Um, yeah. What can we do in these situations to watch people, I don't know, shifting, getting uncomfortable? How do we read the room when the room isn't real? Right. Well, that's a great question. And what you're dealing with, you're dealing from here up. That's all you've got. So when we talked earlier about open-handed gestures and those types of things, like me, I've got this desk and I'm sitting here. I look When you're talking, it looks, I could sit here and look like I'm really interested in what you're saying. But at the same time, it may make me look a little bit lazy and and all that because my posture would be bad but i've sat here the whole time and talked to you like this and said eh, that'd look weird see it's one of those things we've got to be relaxed because everybody's at the house most everyone is, is at their their house or a little office they've set up so you've got to look comfortable and when you use when you, when you speak make sure you use these things we were talking about earlier illustrators as you talk to them so they can because they're just watching tv at this point sort of everybody's getting into that we're getting past that form where it's weird now we're actually able to understand what's happening and focus on what's going on so as you as you speak make sure you use illustrators it helps get your 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 point across really well and don't be staring at yourself all the time you know a lot of people that sit there and they'll, they'll look at themselves and go oh there's me and they'll they'll talk to themselves they don't pay attention to the other person the key is watching that other person and making sure that if they're going, because a lot of people, they'll get their resting face happening where they, you'll talk for a while and they'll get all, and they may be in the best mood in the world. That's one thing you got to watch out for is making sure you don't get oh, so relaxed. And an illustrator is what? It, when oh, you, that's when your brain, your brain emphasizes specific words or phrases like that, specific words or phrases. So when I'm talking and I would say talking, I want to, I want to make sure that I make this little box to sort of keep your attention in there. Not like, Watch me, but it's a sort of little thing to, to, to help keep your your attention toward what I'm talking about. And if you'll know, sometimes you can do these little, not don't go like that, but you do these little things that help bring that that attention to you. And sometimes I'll break my words up a little bit, so it sounds like I don't know what I'm going to say next, and that'll make you start. That'll make you focus in as well, because that stream of of what I call loping, all of a sudden instead of talking in a fluid motion and we're talking about this we're talking about that i would as i went along just a little bit would change things up a bit so it sort of makes that jag and that person will look back at you and it sort of grabs their attention a little bit more so that's, just a, that's just one little thing so interesting let's do some lightning round uh q a because i know we have uh you 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 have a real job, and and uh, I've never seen someone busier than you. We'll just leave it at that. Um, so here's a quick question. Is there any safe generalization that liars tend to tell complicated stories or else maybe very simple stories? Is it, again, there is no either or? Well, well, that's a good – dang, Tom, that's a great question. Well, he's because the what so, You know, watch oh, out. Oh, there you go. All right, all right. So um, – a lot of times people will, they'll get too intricate with their story because they want you to believe it. And they want you to, to, to understand everything that happened and why as they, as they do that. In our course, uh, the true crime workshop.com, we go over what are called, we focus on 911 calls in one, in one module. And you'll notice when someone is, is calling um, the dispatcher, they'll call 911. The story they give when they're the one that actually committed the crime the murder or whatever, their story would be really intricate, have all these little pieces. I was in the gym and the music was blasting. And when I came in from that, we would just eaten and I came, and they give all these details when they should go, I need an ambulance and here's my address. 
or send the police because here's what's going on. They give all these details. So a lot of times you'll see a lot of this complicated, these additives to the qualifiers, we call them, to a story that just don't need to be there. So that's a great question. The, the, the simple answer is the one you want. Simple, but you still get the same picture. You understand what's happening. Keep it simple, stupid, as 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 the old saying goes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what well, else? I think is something I'm sure you'll just agree with. Coming from uh, Vishal, he said, "Don't you think recruiters and interviewers need to be body language experts to tap the right talents through the door?" Oh well, since I'm not one of those people, but I do train them. Uh, it's a great tool to have, but it's like golf. If you're if you're really good at what you do. And someone comes in and uh, say you're a great golfer, you're just going really well. That first couple of lessons where they show you how to change your grip and do those things, man, your game is just goes right in the commode. But after you get used to using those, then it, it's it's a great additive. What they've shown, the tool they've given you, how to how to how to with your swing. And the same thing with someone is hiring people. Sometimes, especially with women, because their brains are a lot more powerful than men's brains are when it comes to reading a person, whether they're a good person, a bad person, or just something not right about them. We don't have time to go into the details of that, which I wish we did. But I'll talk about in the books. So if you get that, I'll, I'll talk about it. But um, it, 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 would good, it would be good to have that, but not to depend on that, because your gut is the thing you got, you, you got to depend on for that. You'll know you'll know a lot of times whether that person is good or not. And the things you would use in the body language part of it and understanding what they, what they were telling you with their body language would be more if they're being honest about the answers about where they went to school and how long they were there, what their experiences are, those types of things. But that person you're, you're talking to, that one-on-one -on -one is so important in that situation that don't discount their body language, but don't just use that as the tool for that. So it sounds like I'm talking bad about body language but i'm just being uh, that's the way it is no i think you you know i'll tell you that uh, often when i like today for example when i go back and i look for the 60 second corona bite um i acutely uh, i will be watching my guest now i'm doing lots of things i'm taking notes and i'm you know and i'm changing the camera angles and i'm moving around and trying not to look at myself um and and, and i look at cues that i always miss i'm not saying they're they're cues where i was where I read it incorrectly, but I just, I look at things now like smile, like a smile or like different shifting. And, and it's fascinating replaying my own show to be able to see this thing. And I think to your point is you can train or be trained, um, you know, in order to be able to become more aware or self-aware. Uh, by the way, I think you made a sale already because Manif said, I'm having a pitch, uh, he corrected, event, uh, tomorrow, and I've just joined the body language tactics course. So oh, you've made at least okay. one one sale today. And um, Wendy uh, has a Zoom call. She said, "Great show, uh, Joe." But more importantly, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Scott. Um, I love all these questions. I'm going to ask you two more like lightning quick ones because I know you have to dash in about two minutes. Uh, so mm -hmm. in thirty seconds, how to overcome being too conscious of your body movements language. Um, I, this sounds so, this is, this is the worst answer, but it's, it's true. Just relax. Everybody says, relax and be yourself. But sometimes you're like, what the hell does that mean? I don't, I don't, you know, I need some help here. So being able to say relax, but don't, don't, wor don't worry about that as much because once you start, especially if you're, if you're a woman, you know, I hate to say, you know, guys, if we care, but we don't care that much. But if, if it's, if, if it's a girl looking at a guy, and you're worried about the way you look and stuff, it's more just be relaxed. You know, you're, you've got the upper hand because you're talking to a guy. Now, if you're talking to another girl, it may be a little bit different. So no. you don't want to, you don't want to do things on purpose that you may hear a body language expert say, always yeah. put your hand up here and do this because it may look fake, but make sure what you learn to do, whatever that thing was, but make it more, make it natural. People like people who look like them and then act like them. So if somebody is doing this as you're talking to them, you want to mirror them, but you don't want to go to that as soon as they do it. You want to work your way around to it. If someone is is doing this as you're talking to, you may run around to doing this and finally some of this, and then you may want to get up close to that. You don't have to do exactly what they're doing, but just to get close so you look more like them. They feel like their brain feels like they're seeing a reflection of themselves in a way. So again, it's this idea of overcompensating and overcomplicating and thinking it out too much as opposed to this idea of relaxing. Yeah. I'm you go in about one in one minute. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to yeah. do the opposite 
today, which is uh, I, I will I will pro promo you and I will show a video even after you're gone. Um, but you know, we always do uh, a quick uh, two final things with my guests. One is I select a quote for them. Uh, I speak two languages, body and English. Uh, yeah. Do you know who said that? No. Uh -uh. That was Mae West. So there you go. Yeah. An expert body language expert. Uh, an expert body language expert. Um, wow. Scott, one more thing, which is uh, this week's uh, Corona question. You get to start us out. We're approaching the Super Bowl. Uh, what What's the best Super Bowl commercial of all time? For me, it was that cat video. Mr. Sure they were herding cats. I thought that was hilarious. Now you got a Doritos commercial or something. Uh, I think you might be right. It was either cars or, or Doritos. Um, but all right, well, you you have whoops, you have logged it in, uh, and we will take that. I am going to go through all the cycle of your various uh, promotions, um, uh, your book, uh, your website, how to follow you, etc. I just want to thank you so much. Uh, for coming in. This was absolutely fascinating. I learned uh, so much. I do want to say one thing is you have this incredible panel, your YouTube channel with Mark oh, Bowden. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the things, and I will, uh, after you leave, I'm going to actually show a clip when you analyzed Oscar uh, Pistorius, obviously as a South okay. African. Fascinating, fascinating. So even after you say goodbye, I'm going to show the video as we wind down. Because this is uh, opposite day, we always end with Chuck Norris being able to give you the vote of confidence. So here he is. You are Chuck Norris approved. And then moving backwards, what? And then I'll show the video. <laughs> I told you it's all okay. back. Um, Oscar Pistorius, what was your take at the end of the day, uh, looking back at this case uh, and the trial, etc.? I think he's one of the worst actors I've ever seen in my life. That was that was just the that was some of the worst fake crying I've ever seen. It was to the point it was comical when you when you stop and look at it and start tearing it down. It's, it's hilarious. I I can't believe I can't believe he they didn't just you know cuff him up there and haul him off that morning. And say, dude, you gotta be kidding me! Don't don't be saying that because it was it was horrible. It was horrible. And yeah, I think he, in my opinion, it looked to me like I'm under the impression that he did that on purpose. Well, I'm going to show the video now. Scott, good luck. Uh, I know you have uh, a whole bunch of things on the agenda for today. Come back anytime. Come join our Zoom after show maybe another time. I know people are dying okay. to spend time with you, but it's been just an absolute pleasure. Good luck with the book. Good luck with everything. And, and uh, you know, thank you for your service. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thanks for having me. I'm sorry it took me so long to get here. But I'm glad we finally yeah, connected. Right. Good things come to those who wait. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Take care, Scott. Bye-bye. All right, so you just left with me for the last few minutes. I'm going to show you just a little clip from this amazing, amazing uh, video. Um, and these guys, they do it all the time. They're looking, they're analyzing. Uh, the rapport between them is just fantastic. I do want to mention that for those of you that are on Clubhouse, I'm doing tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, uh, January 26th at 2 p.m. And it's called Pivoting, the Reinvention of Careers and Life really where I'll be talking about my own experiences with um, Corona TV, uh, what I've learned, how I've changed, and maybe help some people answer some of their questions. So if you are on Clubhouse, I'm Jaffe Juice on Clubhouse. Uh, come join myself and Angus Nelson, who's going to be helping us out, uh, helping me out at 2 p.m. So, uh, yeah, so as I said, it's, it's opposite day. I'm going to show you uh, two things, uh, at least, sorry, one thing in particular, which will be uh, the Oscar Pistorius uh, taping. I ran back to the bathroom and I tried to start kicking the door. I don't know if I kicked it once or twice and I, um, I just kick and kick and I tried to charge the door with my shoulder and the door wouldn't open and I'm screaming now for Reva and I just start screaming, Jesus, please, God, please, 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 just don't let this be what I think it is. I need to get in this toilet to see if it's Reva and if she's not answering, why, not? why isn't she answering me? She's scared, is she okay? So I run back to the room, back down the passage and I get the cricket bat. I start smashing down this door. But here's what I see in it. You get this heightened emotion and he says, please, 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 five times. If we go back to uh, Joe Navarro's idea that any repetition is self-soothing, let's see if that is correct for words. And I think it may well be because you get this strong repetition. I think 
that isn't about him calling out, uh, please, 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 may she be alive. It's himself soothing himself in this situation. Um, I think, oh, then we hear the, the, the pleas to, to God. Uh, I think he says Jesus, he says God. Um, to, to, to Greg's point there, that usually under fear, people will start calling out for a higher power or a parent. They'll call for dad, they'll call for mum, they'll call for God, they'll call for Jesus, something to help them, something to save them. Often in cases, not of remorse, but fear. Uh, Scott, tell us what you got. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, here again, he's describing everything in reverse because he says he shot through the door, then he tried to, to, to knock the door in with his cricket bat. No. He tried to get the door in with his kick the, get the door open with his cricket bat and tried to kick it open and all that before he shot through the door because I'm sure whatever he's mad about that he's after the, that he's so mad at her about he's beating on the door of the cricket bat you come out of there whatever how many times have you heard that story I've never heard it in reverse like that and yeah and and been able to go really it's it's he's telling this in reverse isn't that interesting. Um... The bottom line is the next time you try and uh, and fib and lie and kid and fool and deceive, just know that there are professionals out there that are watching your uh, every move. Um, I'm going to show you one more clip uh, and then we'll move over to the Zoom after show. Unfortunately, Scott will not be on the Zoom after show uh, because uh, he had a couple of uh, pressing engagements. Um, uh, but this is just a little clip from one of those courses um, and if you want to find out more about him, I'll, I'll put all those links uh, on the screen in, in a moment. Here you go. When you're going to learn body language, you have to learn it just like you're learning any other language. If you were studying Spanish and you learned only verbs, it would be a very boring version of Spanish. So what we're going to do is take you through a process that builds on itself. We're going to give you a few pieces of information in each module, and each of those modules will build on the other but you're going to learn it just like you would learn another language. We'll start off by talking about the grammar of body language. We'll put together the structure and how it looks. Then we will go and start building vocabulary for you so that when you're done and after having practiced between the sessions, you will be fluent in body language. This will not be something that's alien to you. And this is going to be what's called a micro course. And a micro course, you get the same information you do in a regular course, except in this situation, instead of taking an hour or 45 minutes to get your lesson done, it's anywhere from three minutes to nine minutes right in there. You can watch it and take it with you anywhere and you learn, learn very quickly. Same amount of information, just you get the information quicker. After we're done with each of these modules, we'll give you some practical exercises so that you can do something in the real world because you're surrounded by body language every day and learn something before the next module. So it's, it's a learning experience. At the same time, you're getting the real world experience too, which is very important. Well, there you go. So I will see some of you uh, in our Zoom after show, which will begin momentarily. Just go to bit.ly slash Corona TV after show. Uh, I will see some of you tomorrow uh, on the show, but then also my first clubhouse room. And there is nothing more to say, except I hope you enjoyed the show today. And uh, you're, you know, he was already Chuck Norris approved. So let's just go to the after show. Thank you for watching Corona TV with your host, multiple author and global keynote speaker, Joseph Jaffe. Corona TV is the show about hope, positivity, optimism, and if there's time left over, a little bit of marketing. The after show on Zoom starts right now at bit.ly slash Corona TV after show. If you like the show, tell a friend or two. Please subscribe to the show at coronatv.show. And if you want to get inside news, previews of upcoming guests, and much more, text Corona TV to 66866 or visit josephjaffe.com slash subscribe to sign up for the show's newsletter. And despite the best ministrations of your wife, you still look ugly. <laughs>